Hello and welcome to this final keynote at Alt Annual Conference 2021. I'm Maren Deepwell and it's my privilege to be the first to welcome you on our final day of this year's conference. Now, before we get started with a keynote I've been looking forward to for a very long time. And before I introduce our co-chair for today, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you've joined us for the gala celebration last night, celebrating the future of learning collaboration between ALT and ITM Productions, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we all did. Um, you can watch the films now at alt.se.uk forward slash news forward slash the future of learning. And um, please do help us share these amazing films as reach out to the community. We hope that you enjoy the conference and recordings will be available from the interactive program post the event and also will be made openly accessible. As before, we want to make sure everybody enjoys the conference safely. So please do familiarize yourself with our netiquette or code of conduct. As we said before, it takes a huge amount to get 389 participants online for nearly a whole week. So I want to say a big thank you to our sponsors and partners who've supported the scholarships, strategic sessions, and also particularly our headline sponsor, Canvas LMS by Instructure. Um, I hope you saw some of the film last night with Instructure and the Future of Learning, and we'll make the most of the opportunity at lunchtime today to meet those experts, find out the insights from behind the scenes and get some extra goodies. Join Canvas and Wool Club, our strategic sponsor, from one o'clock at lunchtime today. Now, we've had a lot of feedback on Discord where the conversation has been absolutely manic for the last few days. And I just wanted to reassure you all that this call will remain available for all registered participants for a month after the conference. So if there are sessions you haven't caught up with, conversations you still want to follow on, resources you want to share, and the conference chat and atmosphere you want to keep going, then this call will be remaining available to you. We have a few technical grumblings in the works this morning, so help is at hand please go to our help pages, the help desk on Discord, or email helpdesk at alt.se.uk. But I can see many of you have joined us this morning, and I'm looking forward to now handing over to our co-chair and keynote speaker. I'm so excited um, to see you all here, so please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Fasana and Lou. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of the conference. I hope you've been enjoying it um, as much as me. I'm absolutely delighted to have the pleasure of introducing our third keynote of the conference, Dr. Lou Mycroft. Lou is an active member of the ALT community. She was actually co-chair for um, OER in April this year. She's worked in public health, has been a community worker and has spent many years as a teacher education. She's also co-founder of the Joy FE movement, which we'll be hearing a little bit more about shortly. Lou writes for the TESS FE. Um, she's former consultant with the Society of Education and Training Institutions magazine. She's TEDx speaker on, and she's written, she, which she presented on the ethics of joy, a presentation I really enjoyed. Um, last year, she won, won the Edgy Futurist Wellbeing Champion Award. Joy um, possibly isn't always something, a value we think about in our own practice, but Lou is really going to challenge that today. In this talk, she's going to explore the concept of joy and its philosophical history. She's going to ask us some really provo provocative questions that will question our own value before actually going into some practical examples. Without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Lou. Thank you so much, Fasana. That was just a beautiful intro. I feel really humbled. Um, 
co-chairing OER was such a loving experience, amazing, inspiring experience that it's great to be back here feeling that sense of love and community. And I cannot wait. I'm deliberately not looking at comments at the minute or looking on Discord because I just want to throw myself into all of that afterwards. I come to you today, everybody, having walked my first long distance path. I was walking the Norfolk, Norfolk coastal path. And so my thinking about all of this, I deliberately challenged myself to do that without any headphones or noise or anything like that to really think deeply through this stuff. So I have been working on this um, over the summer and really to the last minute as my thinking emerged. And that's appropriate and right for Joy FE, which is something that is not fixed, which is moving and which belongs to a whole philosophy of movingness. We need to keep moving. The velocity of life is such that our values-led work really has to keep up with that. Just want to say a note about the slides. They are just going to whir around. Um, just absorb them. Don't worry if the right thing is not coming up at the right time. What I have for you and will share with you afterwards is a copy of the slides that also includes a cartography. So a cartography defined by Rosie Bray Dotty, who I learned with at the University of Utrecht, a theoretically based and politically informed account of the present. So all the influences on me with links, and I will share all of that on Discord, along with the slides and along with the transcript of what I think I'm going to say. But I do that afterwards because there's bound to be stuff that comes to mind in the presence of, of the attention you are giving me um, that I hadn't thought I was going to say. So just relax, enjoy the images and feel free to just comment, comment, comment. And I will, you know, I will come back to those. So a little bit about Joy FE, how it started, what it is going into some of the philosophical underpinnings of it and back to practice and practical stuff and um, provocations for you. So last March, as the world closed down, my friend Stephanie Wilkinson rang me and said, we've got to do something. People are on their knees. Steph and I had encountered one another through professional learning programs in English further education, which I'll refer to as, as FE, the FE Enjoy FE. And we connected on the basis of our affirmative approaches to culture change. So Steph knew about my recent, at the time, TEDx Doncaster talk about practicing and ethics of joy. And that word joy became the starting point for what we hoped might provide a, a temporary uplift for colleagues as we prepared for a new world of working online. We started with a hashtag and emoji combo. So hashtag joy FE and the yellow heart. And the next morning at 7 a.m., we were broadcasting on Twitter Live. If I'm honest with you, we didn't mind at that point whether anybody joined us or not. We were probably doing it for our frightened selves as much as anybody else. But hundreds tuned in and we contact, contact, continued to broadcast daily. The hashtag was joined by a WhatsApp group. And that began to organize online sharing events. And you'll probably remember that Easter came hot on the tail of that first lockdown. So there was a regular 20 or so of us, many of whom had never met physically. We came together on Zoom pretty much every day of that Easter holiday, planning joyful, affirmative action in our places of work. We use thinking environment processes to communicate. Again, there'll be links to this in the cartography. Though thinking environment is my practice of 25 years based on the work of a woman called Nancy Klein, which creates facilitated spaces where we could be present as ourselves and do our best thinking together. By the end of that fortnight, we would produced the first edition of the Joy FE digital magazine, and we're currently producing the 16th. We'd invented the ideas room, which is a bootleg application of the thinking environment, continues twice a week to this day. Everybody is welcome. It's for everybody. You don't have to be an FE. You don't even have to be in education. And um, just tweet us or drop us a line. If Sam is there watching, maybe you could pop something in the comments for how people can um, access the ideas room. It is magic. It's amazing. People come out of there streaming with creativity. And it's really uplifting as well. 
We also share curation of the at Joyful FE Twitter handle so that different perspectives are amplified, different connections created. Um, and Sammy um, at What the Trig Math is our current uh, curator. So there'll be a lot from Alt on there. We talk to anyone and everywhere about Joy FE, sharing the theoretically informed workable philosophy that I'm presenting here today. So the original vision for Joy FE has developed practically. We're writing a book now. We got approached to write a book. We didn't see that coming. But philosophically, we knew from the start what we wanted to be, our overarching purpose, the joyful remaking of education. So what our practice has emerged as is values led. It was always going in that direction, the ethics of joy, but especially the practice of care. Simple thing, right? But we always ask, how are you? And I hope I asked you. I meant to, but my adrenaline was high. Tell me, how are you? A practice of care, bringing people into the room. And we practice our joy through these relations with others, always looking for connection, always looking for collaboration, but anti-competitive practice, which is so hard. I'll say a bit more about that later, but it's in our heads, isn't it, to compete? Mutual aid. That was such a spirit of early lockdown. We are affirmatively critical, so we call out when we need to call out, but not cynical. You'll see a quote from Rutger Bregman going round um, about cynicism and how cynicism is the destroyer of hope. We, we, we want hope. We need to really work on that cynic cynicism. So it's endurance. It's quiet resistance. I would prefer not to. Can we try this a different way? We very much are in the business of no go backery. And I'll talk a lot about that. That term invented by Jennifer Thetford Kay from Shipley College um, in the early days to, to explain that, that pull, that pull back to old containers and old ways of thinking that we'd broken away from. And we are all about amplifying other voices inspired by Sarah Ahmed, citation as politics. Essentially, we're in the business of doing different things, not just tinkering around the edges, not just doing the same things differently. And as we work, we're learning to operate as a hierarchy, no money, uh, as a collective, sorry, no money, no hierarchy, but that doesn't mean no organising, and I'll come back to that at the end. It would have been easy enough in the first place to drift into being a group with closed boundaries and maybe a constitution, allow us to open a bank account, look for funding, accept sponsorship. We choose not to do that. We want to keep our thinking free. And it would have been easier still for Steph and me to position ourselves as leaders. And instead, in, it, what you'll see is that we took a much more challenging path. I want to be clear that everyone who connects with Joy FE, so that is all of you here today, is part of the Joy FE community with an equal voice, equal responsibility and an equal stake. It makes organising really interesting, but it keeps us fresh and everybody brings something different. So anyway, could talk about Joy FE all day and we can do that anytime if you want to get in touch afterwards. But this keynote is about making a much bigger point around social justice. When we first went into lockdown, it was obviously an amazing time for digital practices and those of us who, who explore digital grounded in social justice to finally be trusted. And it was also a time when many of us realised we wanted to live differently, to take a turn towards a values-led life, towards community. With Joy FE, we think we've hit on a way to try and persistently push to do that. And we are not alone. We're driven by so many other thinkers. You'll see them in the cartography whose work tends in a similar direction. So I'm going to shout out Bell Hooks and Brene Brown right here. But others emerged over the past year. Nick Montgomery and Carla Bergman's uh, Joyful Militancy. Fabulous book by Collectiva Sembra about mutual aid in pandemic times. Leadership guru Simon Sinek. Sinek, I never know how to say that. He is promoting a book by a guy called Matthew Barzen, The Power of Giving Away Power, which talks about constellations, which is very much a part of our practice and something we'll come on to. 
Plus, of course, the people who inspire every single day through social media. If you haven't come across Liz Pemberton at Black Nursery Manager, go find her. She's awesome. And my thinking is driven along so far. Um, Jeffrey Boacci, um, actually, this book, Blacklisted, is fabulous. Even better is the book that he's written uh, called, I think, Musical Truth around uh, black music in Britain and culture and history. And the only reason I'm not showing you that is I sent it to my nephew. They are many. And of course, the work is not theirs alone. So in this talk, I'm going to give some big, make some big claims for what is possible and how the purposes and practices I'm sharing with you could really be part of something world changing. And I want you to hear me when I say I'm not claiming this huge hubris for Joy FE on its own. I'm not at all doing that. I'm not saying Joy FE on its own could change the world. But on the other hand, if we keep listening and putting our values into practice, if we keep growing and joining up with other thinkers and activists, why not? Although it can feel like we sometimes don't have enough time to make these changes in the world, activism is actually a really slow practice. Even the Berlin Wall was pulled down after many years of persistence. And I think about activists, activism as a long-term time activist as, you know, that 2P game, British people, I don't know if it's just a British thing, but at the seaside allotments, and you put the 2Ps in and they like shove up the prizes. So, you know, you quite patiently put them in, but you never know when the Smurf key ring will fall. Quite possibly, you'll be on your way home. Activism now is maybe about what happens in the future. I'm 55. My son's generation, he's 25. They are going to be making the changes. But that doesn't mean we can't push and prepare the ground. Many of you will have heard of the anthropologist Margaret Mead. But did you know that she was vilified in her lifetime for her conviction that Western thinking had a lot to learn from the indigenous wisdom it had dismissed and oppressed and prescribed down the years? Anthropology has a lot of problems. My son's a social anthropologist, but I draw deeply on her much quoted claim that a small group of individuals is exactly what changes the world. You just can't be sure when. Conventional power is strong and ex endurance is needed to do the work. So what follows is a justification for working persistently against the tide. I'm going to go big and then I'm going to return to practicalities that you might also like to consider. But first of all, let's look at the bigger picture. Okay, refocus your thoughts. A few hundred years ago, humanity took a turn down the darkest timeline. And some of you are going to re recognize a reference to cult community college sitcom community here. I think I know my people. So this turn to the darkest timeline was not a deliberate turn caused by demons or anything like that. Just some European guys trying to tidy up the world by placing the stuff of life into containers, which also happened to be binaries. Man, woman, nature, culture, body, soul, self, other. Their influence spread to the new world. And in 1661, as I learned from Emma de Beery, Legislation known as the slave codes split black people from white people. Like that was the first time in legislation that race became a thing. And it shattered the solidarity of those enslaved and indentured together by the, those others with privilege, power and wealth. Ironically, at this time in history and over the next sort of 150 years or so, and because history was written by white Europeans, this time has come to be known as the Enlightenment. Well, Enlightenment for some, and Darkenment for many, because the problem with binaries is that someone is always going to come out on top, leaving an other to be seen as somehow less than. The Enlightenment, of course, saw progress, just not for all. Its poster boy was Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. So you can sort of picture, can't you, that figure with the arms and legs stuck out. Look at him, male, European, able-bodied. In fact, he's pretty hench. So I'd guess he's on a good diet too. The epitome of privilege. To be fair, Enlightenment thinkers like Rousseau believed in the power of education to elevate social status, though only in terms really of white men. 
In some senses, Enlightenment thinkers were the original proponents of social mobility through education. Though it's not quite as simple as that, and I really love um, Lee Elliott Major and Stephen Makin's book, Social Mobility, for, for more on this. Over the centuries, Vitruvian man came to be internalised in our heads as the uberhuman, the perfect specimen. The binaries are there to see. Those of us who are poor, disabled, female, trans, black or brown, maybe queer, which is an interesting one, Vitruvian man's assumed sexuality, given he was created by Leonardo. But we don't have the capacity for perfection in that Vitruvian sense. In fact, the Australian philosopher Simone Bignall claims that the further away we are from that Vitruvian ideal in this day and age, the closer we are to death. Think about that for a moment. There's some truth in that, and that's the timeline we're on. It's impossible to separate this enlightenment siloization from colonial expansion, which was the business of most Western European countries at that time. Enlightenment binaries have written themselves into the DNA of colonialism and the neoliberalism that we all live within today, that axiomatic, unquestioning belief that capitalism is the only way and that if we work hard enough, we too can better ourselves socially and financially, social mobility. These beliefs infect our education system, making it easy to forget that some people don't even have access to the basic tools of the trade. In Joy FE, we operate in English further education. Community colleges, work-based learning, community education, a working class service on the whole, subject to regular policy thumbscrews and described by Kevin Orr in the Dancing Princesses tr trilogy, again, it'll be there, all the links in your cartography, as being for other people's children. The darkest timeline is there to see. The social construct of opposites. The promotion of Vitruvian man as the perfect human. Victorian classification of animal, vegetable, mineral. Eugenics the plundering of people, creatures and the earth's resources by European colonisers and ethics of accountability, where we are ruled by bureaucrats and what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs. We are all reaping now what some of our ancestors sowed. They were excellent bureaucrats, by the way, dividing and ruling for 350 years. But there is another timeline, not the ethics of accountability, but the ethics of joy. So let's go back to the 17th century to 1600s in Amsterdam, a lens grinder we call maybe an optometrist today called Baruch Spinoza was writing his opus just called Ethics. He was Jewish by birth, but he'd been excommunicated from just about everywhere from, for his belief that God was in all of us, not just some beardy bloke on a cloud. And by all, he meant not only humans, but animals, trees, rivers, rocks, the whole earth. And this is where joy comes in. Joy for Spinoza was a life force. Energies pooled between humans and humans and the earth's creatures and resources. His ethics was the practice of joy in relation with others, the spaces and connections between us. That was his God. In practicing joy, we enact our power, which is a totally different ethics to that ethics of accountability we're expected to practice in every aspect of public life. And that's a very special kind of power, potentia. Spinoza was writing in Latin and he had two words for power at his disposal. Potestas, what we would recognise as power as usual, status, hierarchy, politics, connected with the individual, as well as their rank. Useful to think of the metaphor of a tree growing upwards, root and branch. And then potentia, an activist energy. Spinoza called it Zoe after the Greek word for a life force. It's about influence unconnected to rank. It tends to be collective, People come together to pool energies and ideas. The botanical metaphor is rhizomatic, so think bluebells. You might plant them and they may thrive or not, but they carry on doing their work underground, popping up in unexpected places. 
Rhizomes are persistent, subversive. Many of you here will have experienced the rhizome of Rhizo 14 and other rhizomatic digital initiatives. You might call them nomadic. I call them bluebells. We are potentia. Spinoza couldn't have known it, but much of the non-European world believed pretty much the same at that time. In many indigenous wisdoms amongst the original inhabitants of lands being colonized by European settlers, humans held their place only in relation to the landscapes around them. Concepts of time and spirituality were very different. If you want to find out more about this, the work of Linda Tuiwai Smith is just excellent. Settlers had no compunction about mining these ancient wisdoms. Um, check out Maslow's hierarchy of needs and where that comes from as part of an anthrop anthropological experiment where he went and lived with the Six Seeker people in Canada for six weeks. Cindy Blackstock shows how he took not the whole belief system, but actually just little bits of it that completely misunderstood that connection to place and time that connection to spirituality, to the ancestors, if you like, and what came before. Maslow never credited the Six Seeker people, though he did make a fine living off their backs. And people like Cindy, indigenous scholars, are only just surfacing this work. Though, like Margaret Mead, there's usually a guy waiting in the wings to discredit them. Citation as politics, credit where it's due, is one of our Joy FE practices. We still get people looking in from the sidelines saying, oh, they're just calling out to the friends. No, this is a political act aimed at pre presenting a different timeline. So we can't turn back the clock on the darkest timeline, but we can acknowledge the need to be on a different path and rediscover the turning we've missed. Spinoza's joyful worldview, the in interconnectedness of us all. An ethics of joy as an antidote to the ethics of accountability that we have every day in our working lives. It's not enough to tinker around the edges, but at the same time, we've got to be realistic about what we can do under current conditions. All of us here, we don't have wand waving power to change the structures, systems and processes of education. We can't dismantle the darkest timeline without dismantling capitalism and show me how if you know how to do that. So how about we run this second timeline, this joyful timeline in parallel? This is the work. This is the Joy FE values line. A lifetime's work has gone into presenting something so simple that came together in that phone call between friends on the 20th of March last year. Joy FE is about the joyful remaking of education, about doing things differently, about anti-competitive and therefore anti-capitalist practice, about resisting the pull towards go backery through a practice of endurance, persistently refusing to tidy things up into those enlightenment and inspired containers. And along the way, we are about that practice of care. There are other ways of protesting, not just the two-piece slot machine. And I share the space here with so many respected colleagues who articulate resistance across all expressions of education. All this protest stuff needs to be said over and over again. We need it for hope and we need it to resist the cynicism that saps our energy and optimism. The cartography I present here uh, is partial and it will grow. So what is the work that Joy FE does, which brings the potential for hope? First, our commitment to doing things different, doing different things gives trust an opportunity to grow. Trust was everywhere in lo early lockdown, quite often performative, I must admit. Leaders often didn't understand how to take di digital online, take learning online, and they had to fall back on trusting those of us who are digitally brave practitioners. We noticed that, you know, they then often quickly got organized around scrutiny and accountability again, how to do online learning works, walks, etc. Taking back control, forcing that ethics of accountability into spaces of joyful practice. 
We draw a lot on Christina Donovan's model for building trust, which begins with transformation. So lockdown was our moment, not only for the stuff we did online, but to raise voices about the digital divide. All of those people who were immediately excluded and the social, economic and political inequalities, which made this be the case, social mobility impossible in these conditions. In Christina's model, transformation is the start of something rather than the end, as we tend to assume in FE. Our digital transformation in March 2020 allowed individuals to unite around a hopeful change, just as we did in Joy FE. Working together, we can then begin to thrive, and this brings a circle of hope and optimism. I certainly recognize this pattern from the last 18 months, including all the times we had to pool our energies and stand firm and resist go backery, the tyranny of that ethics of accountability. The digital shift also changed something in professional learning. Away from what Chloe Hines of the FE Constellation, hashtag FE Tapestry, calls sheep dip CPD, the drive-by expert, towards shared spaces where professionals learn from each other. We're constantly in a dance between the two ethics of accountability and joy. And that's true in the work I get paid for, for the Education and Training Foundation. I can bring so many Joy FE ideas, but we're always dancing around the structures, systems and hierarchies of what we've got with that, you know, that affirmative resistance. We found it helpful to break down what we mean by certain words that new containers need new language. And um, so that's why you will hear us, you know, repeating the same things, defining things, even where we think people already know. For example, the phrase affirmative ethics, coming, which comes from the work of Rosie Bray Dotty, who I mentioned at the start, that's linked to the concept of potential, finding joyful practice in our pain. That's the power Potentia has the behind the shift from the expert-led CPD to a more rhizomatic, educator-led ecology of professional learning. It can be chaotic and it's certainly messy, but what anchors it to purpose is an affirmative ethics. You need the CPD sometimes to learn new stuff, but much of the line, time we can be learning from each other. Values are explicitly spoken about, shared and enacted. Here in practice is Spinoza's move from the expert on a cloud to leadership in all of us. And though the work is joyful, it's also true of potential activism that it channels pain. It gives our pain something to do. When we see inequality all around us, we design our work as a practice of equality, for example. Through decades of being un devalued and overlooked in policy, English further education carries a lot of pain, which before the pandemic was descending into cynicism. Practicing an affirmative ethics allows us to be critical about practices that need to change while using our collective potential to drive that change. There's no integrity, though, without difference. And the practice of difference means inviting unheard and disregarded voices into the work as equal thinkers. This might mean students or identity perspectives or the farthest reaches of further education that don't get heard because colleges have the airspace. They're the Vitruvian. Offender learning, for example. And it means looking outwards into the world beyond our own communities and across the silos and hierarchies of subjects and levels. Those old containers constrain new thinking. So the practical stuff. After watching FE educators be in the engine room of change from the start of the pandemic, I'm firmly convinced that it's possible to run two lines of strategy alongside one another to a potentially entangled far horizon. So the KPI line, that ethics of accountability, that's not changing anytime soon at policy level. FE is still burdened by overwhelming levels of scrutiny, trust between state and the organization and the educator teams at an all time low. To ensure financial survival, assumptions are made at leadership level, which leave little room for values led design. And this can only change nationally 
but that's not a reason for avoiding values-led work. There's a lot of noise in that ethics of accountability. It can be stripped down. It can be streamlined. It can be ticked off more quickly and then energy placed into the values line, the ethics of joy. What if a values line runs alongside the KPI line when it comes to strategic and operational planning? To the naked eye, it might look like a parallel track, but don't all lines appear to converge at least on the far horizon and the values line can be influencing along the way? I'll explore the practical application of values now, but just sit with the possibility of a values line for the moment. Language matters, as I've said, and it particularly matters when we're trying to do something new. Using terms like, for example, the bottom line to drive an ethics of financial accountability privileges the KPI line over the values line. It's a trump card, uses a blocker. And in the tension between these two strategic approaches, we see Potestas and Potentia playing out their inevitable dance. But you know what? The state and the nomad are always present in the same space. The dance is inevitable. Potentia, bluebells, clears a space to dance for a time. The state, the tree, the potestas, the KPI line re-territorializes it. In public sector speak, we call this sustainability and we see it as an aspiration, the point at which the pilot work becomes incorporated into the organisation. We worry so much about this form of sustainability that we don't see the need for real sustainability, ecological sustainability looming over us. When incorporation happens, some no man to move on, some accept it and a new dance begins. In our long experience of doing values work long before Joy FE, educators contribute willingly when asked about their values. Values differ but trust, equality, care or kindness and openness, honesty feature in any word cloud we've seen as Joy FE. I would love you now in the chat, if the chat's available to you, to drop in your most essential single value that guides your work. Which value most guides your work? We do this by form... i just wait and see if some come in. So what is your most key value that guides your work? I've distracted myself by looking at the comments and Moira said the Smurf key ring will always fall eventually. Yes, it will. You've got to hold on to that hope. So equality is coming in. Thanks, Sammy. Care is coming in. Absolutely. Brilliant. Keep them coming. Integrity. Honesty, Emily. Equity from Sarah, wonderful. Integrity, Caroline, for me, the sum of those values as well is integrity. You know when you're working with integrity. Jade has said connection, wonderful. Alison saying trust. Peter saying students is a value. That's a lovely one to unpick. Tucker, accessibility, inclusion. Katie, compassion, brilliant. I think talking about values is something we do do increasingly in education, though some of them still end up laminated on the walls rather than lived. It can be a performative uh, conversation. Fiona's put community, wonderful kindness, respect, brilliant, trust. I love it. And, and education, Eleanor, is a value in itself. So let's think about how we operationalize those words now. And we do this by formulating questions. So I briefly mentioned the thinking environment before, which is a set of processes by which people are enabled to think better together. Questions are at the heart of this practice. Educators always know which areas of their practice need working on. How about we look at those words and drop them into the areas of work? So what might timetabling look like? as a practice of trust? What might assessment look like as a practice of hope? What might appraisal look like as a practice of equality? Maybe more broadly, what might curiosity look like in FE? The practice, or what might FE look like as a practice of curiosity? A wonderful way of actually focusing and then sit down with your colleagues and do some thinking around that question. What might induction look like as a practice of empathy, for example, just seeing some of your words coming in? A values discourse begins here and it doesn't have to start for the top. 
The upheaval in FE since March 2020 has actually begun through Joy FE, through the ideas rooms, to establish the values line in some organisations across all levels of hierarchy. A transformation. I would love you to have a go at those questions and maybe we could set up a space on, on Discord to be able to explore them. Thank you. Watch out for a really simple research tool coming your way from Joyity as well, which is going to be attempting to map the work. So we hope to get that out before the end of the month while Discord is still open. So reminder of Christina Donovan's work around trust. Transformation, not as the end, but as the beginning. How the people unify around that significant change, forming a critical mass at which point they begin to thrive and feel optimistic again and the Smurf key ring falls. Hope is a powerful driver and it's another active practice. Digital practice has provided a vehicle for FE practitioners to engage in professional learning outside their organisations, as we've seen, and that is a significant shift, allowing people to meet and think together beyond the frameworks of official professional development, limited to the ethics of accountability within the organisation. Grassroots spaces already existed, hashtag FE research, movement and FE Twitter actually is a generally affirmative space we've got the amazing Amplify FE um, project moving into its second space uh, with Alt as the driving force there bringing people together helping those practitioner-led professional spaces be manifold there's a real flourishing of educator-led podcast workshops all sorts of stuff in a Spinozian genealogy, and that's by that, I mean how others have been influenced by Spinoza down the years. I've drawn the work of an artist, Maria Hlavayova. Initiatives such as these are defined as constellations. So we have our feet in lots of different spaces. They belong to the rhizomatic landscape. Our work together is on time-limited, open-bordered, common-purpose practices of difference. And the Constellations approach has brought anti-competitive practice to professional learning in further education across, I mean, hugely, like really hugely. It's hard work. Competition is all around us. It's in the words favourite or best. It's in grades, it's in awards ceremonies, and it's a tough mindset to wriggle out of. And there are still teachers who hoard the resources, who compete. That's human nature under capitalism right there. But the pooling of ideas and potential energies via professional learning constellations, along with that commitment to citing and amplifying the work of others, it makes such a refreshing and optimistic change. We believe that there is potential for and some evidence of a culture shift in the landscape of English further education that could spread. It's not a culture change yet. So much potestas is embodied in the system, structures and processes of FE that will be difficult to overcome if a coming together on that horizon of the KPI line and the values line is to be realised. And of course, the status quo benefits some, if not many, in the sector. But as the fallout from an extraordinary 18 months continues to be examined, I echo the hope of the Joy FE movement that instead of doing things differently, FE can start to do different things. I guess I'd like to leave you with the idea of new forms of organisation. And this is the hard work. The hardest work of all in Joy FE is another sort of go back. And that's keeping ourselves from becoming entangled in old ways of organising. We have an emerging Joy FE theory of leadership, which has perhaps been the hardest battle of all. And we don't know of any theory around collectives or actual collectives who've truly nailed it for the long term. If leadership is creating a space for everyone to do their best thinking and take action, and we believe it is, then we can't be directing, having a couple of people directing operations. We're not A&E. We don't need that sort of chain, chain of command, even if people sometimes look towards key people for that because they too are patterned in how everything else operates. Leadership in Joy FE is the vision side of things because, of course, as soon as we let go of raising that, we just drift into the overwork of life as usual. 
potential needs work. It needs visionary work. And leadership of a collective vision and strategy can be done together, but maybe always needs that person saying, come on, we've not thought about the vision for a while. It's not a leadership for control. And most, most of the more contemporary leadership books tell us this, as they have been doing for a long time. What we also identify, and I think this is what's new as being part of leadership, is the patient, persistent administration that is also essential. I didn't realize this until uh, I'm currently reading a book called um, Phosphorescence by Julia Baird. Have you read it? It's wonderful. And I, I do like a reading out loud in the morning. And one of the chapters is about the suffragettes and how they recorded their history in order to resist the ethics of accountability that said history was only written by men. We do this patient, persistent recording administration, tidying up spaces, repeating key messages, meeting deadlines, another form of endurance, a leadership of endurance. And I tell you something, I would never have seen this as my role, but it fits me like a glove. Don't we just live and learn? It actually became harder as Joy FE entered its second year to disentangle the work from friendships formed in the crucible of early lockdown. In the past six months, we have learned to practice radical candor, see the work of, of Kim Scott, <coughs> which she defines as caring personally and challenging directly. Working through this because we're all humans is perhaps the most important joyful world work of all. I'd like to end by reminding us and myself that we are all public servants. There's been so much divide and rule in recent decades and I don't think public service is an identity that holds us together anymore. I'd love to do some work on that. Imagine public service wide Joy FE bringing joyful values work to every staff induction, every decision. Maybe we might get chance together to go there next. Thank you for your participation and atten attention. I hope you will come and join your work with ours. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lou. That was amazing. It's definitely given me a lot to think about and um, a big long reading list as well to follow up on things. Um, I've, I would like, we've got a few minutes and it'd be brilliant to take um, some questions from the audience. Um, if anyone has anything, but whilst um, we're waiting for those questions, um, I I think you know you mentioned a lot of the challenges that we're going to have going forward and the structures that we work in. Have you got any tips for us on how we can stop things going back to normal? Yeah, that go backery is it's the biggest pull of all. Rosie Bray Dotty calls it. The, the gravitational pull of the old um, and go back is a much better way of saying that. It is about persistent and patient work and we can't do that alone. So the first step is to get yourself out of your organization and look for the networks and we have one here. You know, that's why the discord is so great where when you are feeling like it can't be done, you can go in a space and then, you know, rise up because of the energy you're sharing with other people. That's the key. Our ideas rooms that I mentioned, um, all, you know, everything's, you know, everything's voluntary, don't you, Enjoy Effie? I mean, I hope people have really understood that, that when I sell something like an ideas room, all we're benefiting from is more people with more ideas and more energy and more joy. But 8 p.m. on a Wednesday, 9 a.m. on a Friday, that's the place to go when it gets really tough. And of course, the usual advice about finding the allies within your workplace. But quite often, a lot of people who are most active in Joy FE, they are on their own. And they're having to do this cell within the organization or go and work somewhere else, which is what happens sometimes yeah. as well. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. And when I reflect as well, there are networks around my institution that I will connect with, you know, certain people who have those similar values. And and like you say, this community, and I'll definitely be um, engaging with the Joy FE hashtag as well. Um, just quickly check if there's any, um, is, um, any questions that is... 
I've spotted Simon's. Is there a Joy H here? I yeah. hope there is. Well, oh. there isn't, Simon, yet, but that's only because most people have been drawn to us from Effie. Anybody can get involved in this stuff, and that's all it will take. It'll take a critic. I mean, I'm happy to go and talk about this stuff anywhere, but it'll take a critical mass of HE people to take these ideas into their practice. It doesn't have to be separate. It's just another constellation. We just need that HE energy coming in. We need that early years energy coming in. We need that primary, secondary education coming in. Absolutely. And while we started off saying Joy FE, Sammy's reminding me, we, we came to think of that as Joy for Education, not just Joy Further Education, but Joy for Education and not just Education. I think that's um, that's really good. And I think that almost encourages us from Haiti to join that network, you know, rather than necessarily starting a separate one it would make sense I think to become part of that I'm just really conscious of the time but looking through the chat people are definitely being inspired by this presentation like me so it's really good to see I've cheekily copied everyone's values so that I can think <laughs> I can reflect and think about my own as well um, but I just like everyone to use your best emoji to really thank Lou for her brilliant uh, presentation today unfortunately we've not been able to get to Tim's question but um, I'm sure, I know that Lou is looking on the Discord as well, so hopefully she'll be able to answer that. Yeah, quick answer, yes, Tim, but let's have that chat over there. Thanks, Lovely. everybody. It's been wonderful to have you participating so much. Thanks, Lou. I'll do that. <laughs>